since the beginning of the pandemic, numbers are playing an even larger role in our day-to-day -day lives. Which is better, standing 1.5 metres apart or 2 metres? And what exactly is the R rate? Do I have enough masks? And how long can I wear one for? Numbers inform our decision-making. How many kids can be safely in one classroom? Or how many people should I be allowed to meet with? But with new and changing numbers coming to us every day, what's important? And how do you keep your head from spinning? With so many statistics associated with the coronavirus pandemic, it's impossible to keep on top of them all, or even to understand them. Well, if all these numbers are leaving you numb, allow us to help you out by explaining a few of the key ones. The seven-day incidence indicates how many people tested positive within one week, measured per 100,000 inhabitants. For example, let's assume a city with 129,000 inhabitants has this number of positive tests in one week we add up all the positive test results. And then the seven-day incidence is calculated. 48 times 100,000 divided by 129,000 inhabitants, giving an incidence of 37.2. The number allows you to ascertain the current infection rate. In other words, how many people are currently infected in a region? And since it refers to 100,000 inhabitants, one can also say, so to speak, what the percentage of new infections is. A value is considered problematic for a region once it becomes difficult to identify all contacts an infected person has had. In Germany, that is a seven-day incidence above 50. The effective reproduction rate, R, describes the average number of people an infected person passes the virus on to. An R value of two means that one infected person passes the disease to two others, meaning the virus spreads exponentially. If the effective reproduction number is less than one, the number of new infections decreases. While the seven-day incidence offers an initial estimate, the reproduction rate gives you an idea of the dynamics, how quickly the infection is currently spreading from one person to the next. The case fatality rate indicates how many people who tested positive die from or with the virus. If, for example, one out of 10 people dies, the case fatality rate is 10%. If we take a look at the latest case fatality rates from different countries, we see a very inconsistent picture, with the world average hovering around a case fatality rate of 2.4. The number is important for considering how threatening the infection is for an individual patient, but it also has notable problems. On the one hand, the number of unreported cases is very important, and the number of undetected cases also depends on how much testing is going on. In other words, you might get a distorted picture if you test very much or very little. That's the problem with many of the key statistics. Depending on your test capacity, the figures change. Nevertheless, the measurements provide valuable information. In short, it's about relative changes, and you can see those quite well in these figures. And the goal remains the same all through the pandemic, to prevent healthcare systems from becoming overburdened. Let's speak to Maria Barbarossa, who is a mathematician at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies. Thanks for joining us, Maria. So many numbers, too many for anyone to really keep across. So can you help us out here? Is there one number that we should be paying more attention to than all the others? Well, um, there are really many numbers uh, concerning the pandemic, uh, and there have been many coming across during the months. Um, 
we are currently paying very much attention to numbers which indicate the severity of this disease, like the hospitalization and uh, ICU requirement. Um, so people who are in severe conditions because of this disease. And these are numbers to us which inform us a bit more about um, the the severity and, and the healthcare requirement rather than only numbers concerning the detection, so like seven days incidents or RT number. So you say that's what you're currently focusing on. Does the number that's most important change over time? This, this change, of course, um, we have been tracking them essentially since the beginning of the pandemic. It, it became quite clear that the disease require or might have a severe course um, and uh, end up in deaths or require hospitalization and healthcare. And this is, um, of course, an indicator which um, which is not stable depends very much on the on the on the healthcare capacity of the country, but I, I believe is less affected uh, from tracking capacities or testing activity in the country. So we have all these numbers: the R number, the seven-day incidences, and stuff. Do the general public need to be across these numbers? I can understand why governments and decision makers might need to be, but what about? I mean, can't we just stay at home and? do as we're told without getting caught up in the figures? Well, I guess it's uh, probably the first time, um, at, at least since I'm aware of that, and uh, it's probably the first time that people became so informed about the, the meaning of reproduction number or a, even seven days incidence for any disease. Um, these numbers are reported for a number of diseases, but usually are kept in, in in control systems, in healthcare facilities, so people who are working with that. So now it, they went into the community, and I guess it was because of uh, making people aware, making people uh, uh, aware of the severity uh, of the pandemic, uh, of, of the, the way it spreads. Um, but of course, the, the number of the numbers uh, that we get, or the more numbers that we get, this can make people um, more confused. They might not know what they are looking at. It's there are some um, indicators like the reproduction number, or uh, which which is not like temperature measurement. It's, it depends on 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 the cases that are reported, and these are. In case of COVID, for sure, not all cases which we have out there. Yeah, I suppose misunderstanding the numbers could cause more problems than not knowing them at all. Anyway, Maria Barbarossa, thank you so much for bringing us your expertise from the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies. Thank you very much. Now is the part of the programme where you get to ask the questions. You've been submitting them through our YouTube channel. So now let's put one of them to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Should people who have already had COVID-19 continue to wear masks? I answered this question a few months ago and the guidelines haven't really changed, but it gets sent in so often that I guess it's, it's maybe time for a reminder. Um, the short answer is that a lot of aspects of COVID-19 immunity are still pretty hazy because people simply haven't been recovering from it long enough to provide solid long-term data. Um, based on what we've seen so far with the disease, people who get infected once do acquire some immunity for a period of time. Um, the big problem is we still don't really know how long on average uh, that period is. Uh, so for some framework, it makes sense to look at what we know about other coronaviruses that infect humans. And, and studies there have revealed that immunity can wane pretty swiftly. Um, a number of them convincingly show people can be reinfected with some of those pathogens uh, within a year of catching them once. So far, there have been a few dozen documented cases of, of that also happening with COVID-19. But as, as proving reinfection is, is quite a complex challenge, the real numbers are almost certainly higher. Um, in some of the documented cases, the people who got it again showed no symptoms the second time around, but, but in others, they got the disease worse. And we still don't know whether they were infectious to others. So 
Until we have better data, guidelines from health authorities like the CDC um, recommend that you continue to wear a mask, especially in indoor public spaces. Um, until we have more information, you should assume that masking up is still an effective way to protect not only others, uh, but yourself, even if you've had COVID-19 once and recovered from it. And you can submit a question for Derek through our YouTube channel, DW News. Now, I know we've already thrown a lot of numbers at you in today's programme, but bear with us here. We have just a couple of more for you because with the vaccine production starting up around the world, we asked you through our social media channels if you would take a jab against COVID-19. So here are the results. The largest proportion, over 40%, said they'd rather wait and see before taking a vaccine. 38% said they are prepared to take the vaccine and around 16% said they would not be willing to get immunised against COVID-19. Now, of course, it bears mentioning that virologists say immunisation is the only way to get a grip on the coronavirus pandemic, but it seems there is still a fair bit of scepticism around the vaccines we've seen developed in recent months.